no longer an issue of us versus them. Climate change is no longer an issue of developing countries versus developed countries. Climate change is no longer an issue of north versus south, east versus west. Climate change is an issue that affects us all. And while society continues to grapple with the impacts of climate change, we find that women, men, and even youth have different experiences. And this informs the kind of technologies or climate responses that are developed. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a rural area or an urban area. These are highly gendered spaces, which are sites for further empowerment or even disadvantage for women. For example, we find that women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die when a disaster strikes. And this is because of the roles that women undertake. You find that women are the caregivers for the elderly and even for the children at home. So when a disaster strikes, they are more vulnerable because they are not able to flee as fast as the men. At the same time, we find that women are not exposed to coping skills or even life saving skills such as swimming and even climbing of trees. And this would in fact affect their ability when a disaster strikes. So those are just examples to give us an idea of some of the disadvantages we face as women. I'm sure if a man comes, they're going to be able to give disadvantages from their perspective. But today, I'll be talking on behalf of the women, but also trying to link together with the men. Because when we talk about gender issues, it's not about men and women, because there are also other social markers in society that also inform the kind of decisions and actions, and even how we respond to climate change and the climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies that we eventually adopt. And these social markers include our marital status, our age, it also includes ethnicity, religion, income, amongst the others. So when we talk about gender, we don't look at it as binary, but we're also looking at it at the intersection of these other factors. So in order to be able to better understand how we can use gender as a tool to undertake a deeper analysis, I joined a team of researchers to undertake a study on the uptake of climate smart agriculture through a gender lens in Western Kenya. And we undertook this study in Nyakach sub-county in Kisumu County and Soin Sigowet sub-county in Kericho County. Both of these counties are grappling with the impacts of climate change and climate variability, which leads to drought and to drought and floods. So together with researchers from the CGIR and the Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organization, in partnership with other NGOs, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, and even farmer groups, we work with the farmers to expose them to a suite of different climate smart technologies and practices focusing on crops, livestock, and sustainable land management. So, during our study, we found that it didn't matter whether it was a male farmer or a female farmer, all the farmers in the community were willing to adopt climate smart technologies and practices. However, like I said before, factors such as culture, such as level of education, um, such as marital status and age, tend to influence the level up to which they, ad they adopt um, the climate smart technologies. So, for example, during the focus group discussions, when we spoke to the communities um, from the Kalenjin side, we learned that during the menstruation, women are not allowed to undertake farming activities. For example, uh, harvesting of crops, or weeding, or even looking of, of cows, because they are believed to possess witchcraft to be listed, and this could lead to product, uh, loss of productivity. And then when we went to the Kisumu side and we, we spoke to the farmers there, we also learned that they have a hierarchical system of undertaking their farm activities. So we learned that in the, in the community, the, the daughter-in-law is not allowed to harvest before the mother-in-law. And why this is significant is because we've, we've been talking about technologies and practices such as early maturing crops. So if the daughter-in-law plants early maturing crops and she needs to harvest, and maybe her mother-in-law did not adopt this, then it could be conflict or loss of yields. And then focusing on another example or 
rather focusing on the uptake from crop, crop perspective, we find that we have a 62.7% level of uptake of, by farmers who have a primary level of education. And this shows that we need to continue encouraging the girl child to go to school just as much as the boys so that they are also able, so that they are also exposed. So currently I'm working at the International Union of Conservation of Nature and my work here involves integrating nature and people as we develop climate change solutions. And simply put, nature-based solutions refers to using nature to address societal challenges while ensuring human well-being as well as biodiversity conservation. And so IUCN has developed the global standards for nature solutions, which have targets and criteria that we can use to integrate nature solutions effectively, whether in the rural areas or in cities such as Kisumu. And specifically for our topic today, criteria number five talks about um, inclusive, transparent, and empowering governance processes. So as I wind up my talk today, I would like to recommend the following pieces. Capital, capacity building, culture, and cash. When we talk about capacity building, we're talking about sensitizing the community, we're talking about sensitizing our policy makers and other practitioners on the importance of a gender lens when we're developing climate actions. And not only, capacity, not only sensitizing and creating awareness, but this also entails exposing them and teaching them about tools and methods that they can actually use to integrate gender. Because as we have realized from the previous um, presentation, rather the previous example, it requires us to take the extra step. And culture, when we talk about culture, we're talking about creating culture as a way of life. So we want to create, we want to integrate gender equity, gender sensitization as a way of life. And so we want to build on cultural norms and behaviors that empower women and place them at a point of advantage, but not only at the community level, but even in our institutions. We would like to encourage each one of us to ensure that we apply a gender lens, even at work. So even as you're developing your climate actions, always remember what will be the impact on the men, what will be the impact on the women, and what will be the possible impact on the young, young people. And also try to ensure that Whenever we need women to participate in events like this, if the lady has a child, allow her to come with a baby and provide someone to help her take care of the baby. So this is what you mean about culture, going the extra mile. So the final C is about cash, and this is about financial investment. You know, we need to create, or rather we need the means of implementation to enable us to develop climate actions. But when it comes to gender, this requires even very deliberate efforts too invest in and to plan for, for integrating gender, because we know what is planned for and what is budgeted for is implemented. If you're going to remember any of the three C's, <laughs> any of the three C's that I have talked today, uh, remember uh, the final C, which is culture, because culture is strategic. Thank you.